Shalom and welcome to another edition of Our Daily Bread. I'm Messianic Torah and this week's parasha is the sixth parasha of the book of Bereshit, also called Genesis, and it's called Toldot, which means generations. And this week's parasha starts in Genesis, or Bereshit 25, verse 19 through 28, 9, with the half Torah in Malachi, or Malachi 1, uh, 1 through 2, 7. And my message for 2014-15 is called Yore Wahe Provides. Now, in this week's parasha, um, we get into the uh, story of Yitzhak. And, uh, you know, this is really exciting because, uh, you know, the, Yitzhak doesn't actually get much mention. I mean, clearly he's a, a key figure, you know, uh, as the promise is made, you know, a lot of times it's it's recalled as, you know, uh, the seed of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And so, you know, that, that's a pretty substantial role. And yet at the same time, really there's only um, uh, this one segment, pretty much, um, w that focuses on Yitzhak uh, compared to a lot of stuff that is really goes into uh, Avraham and then it spans over multiple parashot and then we also have um, Yaakov which gets even more so we're gonna see uh, the first thing that we're gonna start off with I always like to start with the title of the the parasha in this case it's Toldot so that's spelled Tav Vav Lama Dalit He um, in the ancient Hebrew, these these can have uh, each of the letters are also pictographs, which can have meanings, and sometimes we can find additional insight there. Um, they can have various um, meanings, but I generally kind of go with stuff that I've kind of found in my own studies to to be consistent. But there's other charts and sources out there that'll say what people believe. Uh, the meanings of these pictographs are. Um, that being said, realize that uh, I could write a book, anyone can write a book. Um, that doesn't make it so. So, you know, sometimes people, they see a chart or something. I've seen many charts on, you know, on the uh, ancient, like Paleo Hebrew and, uh, and stuff. And the problem is, is that, you know, that, that's usually work done by somebody from a specific slice of time who had their resources that they used. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make it fact. Sometimes people just jump on and, oh, it says it here, so that must be what it is. But in my own study over the years of, of ancient Hebrew, I found that I disagree with some of the interpretations that other people have, have had on the ancient Hebrew. And, you know, it, the point is, is, you know, use your own brain. It's great to check into resources from other people um, but you always have to have your own mind uh, ready and willing to do your own research and understand that your research and their research doesn't necessarily make it fact. It just means that, you know, these are this is what you've assembled based on what you've looked at. Um, one of the things that I want our new website, uh, levator.com, to have is a section on critical thinking because I feel like that's one of the big flaws in religion and that's one of the big flaws in politics and and just you know people in general is that they lack critical thinking and uh, if people had more critical thinking a lot of you know problems would be solved a lot of things would would be analyzed better um, there wouldn't be so many goofy theories um, you know, the most dangerous thing out there is ignorant zealousness. And, and that's basically what you get with a lot of um, religious people. So um, everybody thinks they know everything, and even if all they know is a speck, uh, they're overly zealous about it. And uh, when you default back to critical thinking um, and, and you ask more questions, and you realize and you make more observations instead of conclusions then you're gonna your mind's gonna be more flexible and open to see things in a broader scope to be wiser and to not be so rigid 
And that's how you avoid being blind and blindsided. Because there may be a topic and I might have five or ten different things I think about that um, based on various things. And I don't have to you know, write a conclusion on a matter. I can just look at observations. And it's important for us to do that. So when we look at the ancient Hebrew on this, Tav uh, can be Mark, but it also has a bit of a definition of end, um, even in comparison with Mashiach um, uh, being the Aleph and the Tav, which is really the beginning and the end. And so I think in this particular case it could be um, end. Vav is like a tent stake and that is secure and uh, I think that that's a pretty solid meaning for that. Uh, Lamed um, can mean uh, teach, can be the, uh, the shepherd's staff. Uh, the Dalit is the door, um, which obviously has to take us back to Mashiach, who says he's the door as well. And, uh, you know, all of these things. Uh, and then the hay, which is the window, which also can mean reveal, and it's the model of... Uh, both the Dalit and, and the hay are, are things that also divide. It's important to look at the function of things. Um, you know, not only basically take a look at those things throughout all the scriptures, how they're used, um, literally in their model, in their pattern that they create, but then also to look at the function of things, because a lot of times that's just another pattern. So when I talk about the mechanics of something, or the model of something. It's really about relationships between things and how things work. And so when you when you look at the scriptures, they work a certain way. There's certain mechanics. There's certain patterns that will, f will follow things and that are surrounded by certain elements. And so when you start to recognize those things, you're going to be able to combine the, uh, the whole Torah together in a way that is unique because the Torah has this wonderful um, design in my opinion where where it has all these pieces and and you know whether a person wants to look at them in a linear fashion and chronologically um, or they want to say well some of these things are connected to other things it may be a direct reference to them there's tons of references that aren't direct references. They're patterns that is here that that it doesn't have to be a quote. You know, those are the easy ones. You know, those are those are for beginners, in my opinion. You know, where it, you can see that it's clearly talking about this other section. You can go to that other section and and get some more information and bring the two together and really get a bigger picture and and unlock a deeper understanding of it. You know, but then there's ones where this pattern is created here, and there's another pattern over here, and in the literal text, also known as the Bishat, it may not directly be quoting that. So if you were looking for a quote, you wouldn't know the two were connected. But when you see the pattern, or the mechanics of what's going on, or the or the the structures, and and how many pieces, and and you start to see, hey, that sounds very similar to this story over here, or this thing over here and you put the two together and you start to be able to uh, unlock things. And what's great is that you have this you have this puzzle as I call it with the Torah and when you put different parts together they create things and and they teach us things. And sometimes those things on the surface you don't see how they connect, but with more and more study of the whole Bible you'll be able to connect the pieces better. And that's, that's the problem with a lot of people is A, they've never even read the whole Torah or the whole Bible once and all the way through. Number two, they don't study it enough to be familiar with it enough that they can start assembling it in their mind so that when they read something or they see a word, they can think about where that word is used all throughout the scripture. See, right now you have programs that can do that, like eSword where you can type in a word and it'll show you everywhere that word is used. That is awesome. That is an awesome tool. Um, but, you know, better than any program like that is also our mind. Our mind can process all of that. 
and the more of the Torah that we know and the more we can assemble, uh, our mind will pull up some references in a way that you know, a computer only goes and gets you what you ask for. But the mind is, is superior in that sense because it may make some connections and it may do some predictive um, connecting and, and, and help you see things. You know, when you understand things, it's like the light goes off and you say, oh, well, this is kind of like that over there. You weren't looking for that, but your mind brought those two together because uh, there's a portion of processing in your mind that works without you consciously thinking about it. And, and so it's a great processor and it's a great filter. And so the more Torah you can put into yourself, the amazing things will come out of it. And that's why I always... Uh, promote people to do more Torah study, to get in the Word of God daily, not randomly, get systematically. That's what's great about the Torah portions, the parasha. Um, they take you through the Torah, and you can add to that. As a matter of fact, I'm working on um, a way to pull all of the Bible together, the old and the new, and keep it in line um, with... Um, you know, supplements to Torah portions so that it's relevant and uh, you can still pull through all those things. A few people have attempted this uh, mostly with, again, direct quotes and other people have just chopped it up and thrown it in there. And I know FFOZ had one where, you know, they were just starting in Matthew and going like that, but I'm talking about actually lining up the concepts and the patterns and the constructs, not just the direct quotes, but all of them. And, and building this together yeah, so that you can go through the Torah portion and take it through every year, but at the same time be getting through the, the Prophets and the Writings and the Psalms and the Proverbs and the New Testament as well. And then also in a, in a context that's going to make sense, not just something thrown together. It's a tremendous project. And uh, one of the only ways that you can actually do that is if you study the whole Scriptures enough to have enough of that in your mind to help you start sorting those pieces together. So yeah, be on the lookout for that. But let's jump back into Toldo. Toldo means generations. And it's spelled Tav, Vav, Lama, Dalit, Hey. So this can be um, the end, secure, teach, the door, reveal. We're teaching to the door, reveal. Um, that's how I would interpret that in the ancient Hebrew. And so it comes to this root word, yalad, which is uh, this concept of begetting or, or, or the travailing in birth, um, uh, bringing forth uh, the children. And, and this is what the generations um, mean, uh, to beget. And so it's interesting because we start off this week's parashah when we look at the, the that, that root word then is vav lama dalit, which is which would be secure the teachings of the door. Now the door, Mashiach says, he is the door. So really, this concept of begetting um, of generations uh, is centered, in my opinion, around the securing of the teachings of the truth of Mashiach. Who, who is the truth? Who is the word of God? Um, the law, as uh, you know, the living law, as some would call it. So, this is what this means. These are the generations. Now we know that we have positive generations and negative generations, but when we take a look at that root word of what it really means to beget, why? Because that's the living. And when we compare that to the dead, it was funny because on a totally separate note, I was reading earlier about the. Uh, in Matthew, I think it's 25-ish, um, 24, 25, somewhere in there, um, where Messiah is talking about, you know, the the Sadducees are there and they're they're talking to him about the about resurrection. They're trying to kind of um, trick him with the concept of raising up seed for your sons, and and there's the seven brothers and. They all die, and whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And then after that, he he corrects them on multiple spots. And one of the things that he says is that 
God is the Elohim of the living, not of the dead. And so it's kind of interesting how that plays into this because if a person is categorizing um, the the generations of the wicked, um, you know, they may not fall into that concept, the ultimate root of this word, which would be the generations, of those living generations of um, of those who would secure the teachings of Messiah. And so we see that kind of contrast. And then you take that root word, and then on the beginning and the end, you have the Tav, um, uh, which is the, a mark, or it could be also considered the end, and then the He, which is like the window, which also generally means reveal. And so the end revealed of the securing the teaching of the door okay that to me tells you that that's that those generations are are the judgment it's almost it actually ties into this concept of of you know who's my mother who's my brother those who do the will of my father this ties into this concept well who's doing the will and who did do the will you know it, it, it goes the fact that a person can change their their father this is what can happen when you go from doing wickedness to doing righteousness you know he said if you were Avram's seed you would have Avram's works uh, you're of your father the devil right because they had they were sinning and yet you can repent from that and you can change and that's one of the great mysteries of the scriptures and, and, and creation really is how you can go from one to the other, you know, either way, either direction. So, what do you do? The parable of the wheat and the tares. You wait till the harvest, right? Because we won't know who's who. You get into Ezekiel, and you get into these concepts of, you know, the righteous man who turns to wickedness, that his righteousness will be forgotten, or the wicked man who turns from wickedness and 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 starts doing righteousness, his wickedness will be forgotten. This is this concept, but to turn, that means to actually change. That isn't just someone who said they were sorry. And so, what happens there? It's, 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 it's amazing that literally, you know, it is like being born again. I mean, people throw that around, it's so cliche, and they think they've got it all figured out, which I totally disagree with. I think it's a much uh, uh, deeper concept than what most people, oh yeah, yeah, I know this, you know, they know everything. Well, I don't think so when I talk to them. Um, you know, a foolish person says, yeah, yeah, I know these spiritual things. Okay? You don't know. You didn't see it. You didn't touch it. You don't know how much it weighs, what it sounds like. You don't know. you got a theory in your head. That's not knowledge. Okay? That's, that's just you, your theory. No matter whether you really believe it or you don't. So what? What are you going to say? Oh, well, because I looked up this word in Strong's or because I checked that out. So what? There's thousands and thousands of generations before you and thousands of years going back to creation. And how much do you know of all of that? Not even a speck worth. How much of it was all written down and captured? Not even a speck. So don't tell me about what you know about things that are thousands of years removed from you. You don't even know what happened, uh, you know, 200 years removed in the situation and the spiritual things and all the people of God and, and all, all these things. There's so much more to it that, that you diminish it by acting like, oh yeah, well because I looked something up in, a, in, in Strong's and, and I, I checked over there and I had a thought, all of a sudden I have this knowledge of the creator of the universe. You don't have squat. You know, that's reality. You're a speck of dust. Okay? A vapor in this big picture. You don't need to break about what you know. You know, discuss what you think, you know, and, and keep it at that. So when we look at this concept of, of these generations, uh, these toldo, right, um, it becomes very interesting because it's really about uh, what these things uh, can mean. So if, if these generations, going back to what we were saying, if you don't know who's who, and who really is of what bloodline, right? Until the end, then then understanding this concept of when when we talk about Toldo, that it starts with the top, which is the end. The end being revealed. 
and the securing the teachings of the door and and that's going to be revealed and that's going to really show who's who and who are the generations and where that obedience to God has gone right who's my mother who's my mother or brother you're going to see where that's gone over the scope from literal generations to generations so next we're going to talk about this concept and it's interesting we'll finish with one more thing about Toldo which is the fact of first first use as well we have a situation where um, this word if you look it up was first used in Genesis uh, 2 4 and there, it's kind of I just thought I'd take a second to talk about it because it's kind of an interesting little thing um, the verse said these are the generations of the heavens and the earth after they are created and so the first use of this word um, what makes it interesting is that it's not about you know next we're going to get into the generations of Adam right and Adam and Hava and, and, and their children after them but it's interesting that the first thing the first time this word is used is in creation so what is it how can the heavens and earth how can they bring forth how can they have generations I mean that doesn't make much sense so he asks you know some questions what does that mean you know are the what are the heavens and the earth begetting and how is that tied into creation and all these things um, and I think that you know I'm not going to dig into it deep right now um, as, a, as a sidetrack but it's something for you to contemplate maybe in another video we'll we'll talk about what I think um, as far as how that relates to heavens and earth and the things that the earth beget and how are how are they are you know even taking it back to the meaning or potential meaning of this word what does it mean about these the end of these things and in, in securing uh, the teachings of the door and and that division between all things and how all things are defined um, there's there's some very interesting things going there and, and going really on multiple levels even contrasting showing it's going to be generations of both heaven and earth and we're going to get to that in the very next section now now would you have two generations and 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 two different um, is there generations of heavenly things and generations of earthly things that are begotten of those types because even though they're connected things that are heavenly and things that are earthly they're different and yet and yet there's some connections well it goes right into the next portion which is the generations of Yitzhak and what we see is that we have right the children of and the nations right because it goes into uh, you know it starts off with these are the the toldot of Yitzhak right and then it goes right into um, Rivka being barren and Yitzhak prays and and God hears his prayer and then she conceives twins and it says specifically that there was you know she's kind of asking why am I like this because there seem to be fighting in the, in the womb and 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 she's told that two manner of people right and and two nations and two manner of people are in her womb and so this is this different types of children and we're gonna have children and nations and these are gonna be different types of people and that's a very uh, interesting um, concept there and if we tie this back again following that word uh, it, it's like in in uh, politics or whatever they always say follow the money right because that tells the story that's the real connector um, that will connect things and start to paint the picture of what's really going on well in the same way in the Torah I would say follow the words because it's a document of words Mashiach is called the word right and and so it, it, it's good for you to think about the words and to contemplate them and to follow them around throughout the scriptures and see when was that word first used how else is it used what is the context and that will give you 
things that you can take and you can apply to understanding other verses where that word is being used. You know, I think that that um, Strong's is a great resource, and there's other resources that are great in dictionaries, but and and they were great works that were done for us. But that's just one person's opinion and research. And so, guess what? You have the whole Bible yourself. You can download a free program like eSword at e-sword.net, and you can type in word searches in the whole Bible, and it'll show you every verse that that word's used. And you can look at the root word and see where the root word is, and what's the difference between when the root word is used and the other variation of the word, and where is it all used. Like we have these tools where what used to take somebody, if you had a scroll and you were going to go through there and say, well, let me find every use of this word in Hebrew, you know, and you were going to go and read the whole Torah and then mark down where it all was, like for one, sturdy, uh, one word study, yeah, I'll see you in a few months. I can have that in two seconds with a program like eSword. Like it's insane what we are available to do. And the diligent people before that wanted to know, before computers and, and all the software that we have now, they just did it. And they just scanned the text and they just worked with the Word of God and a workman's worthy of their hire. And their diligent hand, uh, I'm sure, was rewarded. But we have it easy now. And so there's no excuse to being lazy because the keys to the, to the knowledge of all these things they're right there for us. Anybody can pick it up and do it if they want to take the time to do it. So when we go to first use, we see this uh, toldo. We see the generations of heaven and earth. Well, then we draw it back and you ask yourself the question, is this what it means? Saying that there's two manner of people? Is one heavenly and one earthly? As in the original use of this word? I think so. And you can actually see it in the description. It says, Asaph became a hunter, and Yaakov dwelt in tents. So one person, right, was an inside guy. That's really when we look, well, what's the difference between, what's it mean, and he's in the tent, and the other one's, right, a hunter, who is is described even by Yitzhak as the, about the smell of his raiment, is the smell of a field, right? Because he's going out, he's hunting, he's chasing after what? flesh. He's chasing after the flesh. He's going into the field. In the Ramez or spiritual definitions, the field is like the world. You can see that in defined by Mashiach in parable of the um, wheat and the tares and, and, and other things. Uh, he describes the alternate meanings for these things uh, all throughout the scriptures. They're, they're described as well. Um, so, so when you see this, you say, oh, well, Wait a minute. A person could assemble this and say, so you got an inside man and an outside man. Well, what does Mashiach say? He talks about the Pharisees as as, as being outside men, right? He says they're outside, right? They're like a sepulcher. Death is inside, but it, it's, it's washed and clean on the outside. He talks about the inside of the cup versus the outside of the cup. He's constantly making the comparison of these types of people. And... And so if we apply that back here, we see that Yaakov is an inside person. He's, an, he's a spiritual person, in, in my opinion. And so I think this takes us to the generations of the heaven and earth, that there's things that are, that are begotten of the spirit, and there's things that are begotten of the earth. And some people, even Cain and Havel, we see the difference. One offers something from the field, and another offers something that has the life in it, right? That blood. So it's again an inside versus an outside thing. These patterns are continuous throughout the scriptures. And so they'll help you, like I said, connect those pieces of the scripture. So we've got two manner of people, children and two types of nations. And we already know what the parable of the wheat and the tares when it says, oh, what's that mean? Two nations? And they're different types of people? Well, parable of the wheat and tares. It divides out the people into two groups of people. And those would be two nations with two different rulers. There's God, right? And it talks about the wheat that are the children of God, and there's the children of the devil. That's two nations. That's also two manner of people. You see, you have to pick up these patterns and these structures and say, what's going on here? So 
when we get to the fact that that you know even though one um, was firstborn, which is also known as the beginning of my strength, right? Um, but as it says, the younger is is going to rule over and be greater than than the elder. Okay, and so when we see this, we see the same thing in this the same pattern. So there's a deeper meaning here. So next we're going to talk about. So these are the generations of, of Yitzhak. What comes out of Yitzhak? Uh, what comes out of of this this son, this miracle son, right? Who was saved from death? Well, within that son, right, his seed. There's two different kinds of people inside him. So could go one way, could go the other. And this is the story of Israel. Everyone goes, oh, Israel's they're the good guys. Oftentimes they're the bad guys. Okay? They're good guys and bad guys. That's what makes them interesting. Sometimes they're obeying God. Sometimes they're disobeying God and rebelling against Him. Okay? Sometimes they're doing God's will. Sometimes they're not doing God's will. They're going back and forth. Okay? So, here we get this with Yitzhak. Now, next we get into She is My Sister, okay, in Gerar. And, you know, what I mean by this comment is that we get back to Avimelech. Now, the funny thing is, is this is the same thing that happened with Avraham. So, you're not having deja vu. Avraham went and dwelt in Gerar and dealt with Avimelech as well and said the same thing. She's my sister. How about Sarah? Okay. And then <clears throat> he almost got punished from God. Right? And then Avimelech says both times to Avraham and to his son, you know, why'd you do this thing? And they both said the same thing. Oh, we thought that the you know men of this place might kill me and take my wife. Okay, and both times he does the same thing. He makes a decree: anybody who touches this man or his wife shall be put to death. He did it for the son. He did it for the father. And then he also, you know, these are the patterns that you need to remember, because otherwise you start getting fuzzy and you start going, "Oh, was that Avraham or was that with Yitzhak or did some of those elements happen?" Hey, you start to see similarities. Go back and check, and then line up the similarities and see, is this consistent throughout here? Because then there's going to be a reason. Or is it just this one thing was there, but these other things weren't? I, I don't know until you go check. So if you see with Avimelech, then you see, okay, yeah, I made the decree. Then he comes back. Then both Avraham and Yitzhak, both fighting over wells of water surrounding around the Be'er Shiva. The well of the seven, which originally was uh, was with Avraham, the seven, it was the well, but he says part seven ewe lamps to say this is my well, right? And then what happened? Avimelech wants to make a covenant with him, made a covenant with Avraham that he wouldn't uh, harm him, and he's making another covenant with Yitzhak, okay? And, and both times the servants of Avimelech took away wells. Now, he said he hadn't heard about this, right? Well, it's your servant. You know, get him under control. But they're taking away the wells. So what does this have to do? Well, there's a couple of things. Before we get into the wells, I'm going to talk about she is my sister. See, a woman is like in the Ramez is like the heart of man, right? And when we get to this, when we say, what does it mean if the two are one? What is the pattern? What does it mean that the person's trying to is gonna kill me, right? And take away my wife. They see my wife is beautiful. Well, we go back to this very first thing, right? This told of all this stuff helps Link us and give us hints along the way. First use Genesis 2.4. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth. 
So we've got, then we get to uh, Esau and, and Yaakov, right? We say, okay, got an outside and an inside. Okay, these patterns are repeating all the way through this Torah portion. Next, you'll get to the part where, what is this about the difference between the man and his wife? The man in that model represents the flesh. Okay? The outside, and that's the protection, right? That's the housing of the heart, what's inside, which is more vulnerable. We have this shell, you know? We're protecting our insides in the same way a man protects his wife. Okay? And so in, in the Ramez, what we see is this pattern of that the people of that place see how beautiful the heart is of Avraham and the heart of Yitzhak. And then they want to do what? He's afraid that they're going to kill his flesh and take his heart and take his spirit. Right? So there's multiple possible meanings there. One can be just that that whole picture means that he's just afraid of them. In this say, another thing that I see is that their desire or their or their lust, right? Their desire would, in relationship to Abraham or to Yitzhak, would be to destroy his flesh, because ultimately they are jealous of his heart. And and and. and and if we look at this in the spiritual sense, his heart is for God. And that can cause people, when they see your desire, right, just as they saw with Mashiach, what happened, his heart was for God. He wasn't trying to come and claim power and, and wealth for himself, which he certainly could have done. He said, not my will, but thy will. Okay, when he was tested by Satan, he's offering him all these things. Those are earthly desires. Do you want food? Do you want riches? Do you want all this? He wanted to serve God. And at the end of the day, the same event happened. It was his heart, right, represented by his wife, that was beautiful towards God. And the fear is that when you have that love for God, that the people who don't have that, right, are going to want to kill you. I mean, that's the pattern that it creates. It just teaches us that people who don't serve God will want to ultimately kill those that do serve God. I mean, that's the simple message in the Ramez. But we see this pattern created and with, with this curiosity of she's my sister. And and uh, how the rulers uh, you know recognize the beautiful wife and then want to kill him as a result and in a way how he tries to protect himself is that oh well she's my sister well, what does that do in a way it's almost saying she is available and it's almost saying that 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 you can, you know, if I if I show you the clear difference, right, and the separation, that I'm separate from you, right, and my wife is something that you cannot possess, she is separate from you, then there comes, just like with uh, Paro, when he, the new Paro who came in, um, who said, you know, look at them, they're too many, and they could join to our enemies. He saw them as separate. Not that they were together and and everything was okay, um, which was with the previous Paro, where they dwelled in the land of Goshen. And that's kind of like, to me, she is my sister. Like, okay, well, you know, we're we're able to interact here together, we're able to be together, and there's no problems. And then with the second one, the second one viewed it differently as that's that man's wife. Okay? And they saw the blessing in the heart of serving God in, in, of Israel and said, mm, these are not 
these are not joined with us. We are not really connected with these people. They're separate. Therefore, they have to decide, do I have to put them under subjection? Do I have to kill them? And that's what always happens. Okay, When they're saying, hey, we're going to serve God, then the people who don't take who don't serve God or don't serve God in the case of religion as seriously, um, they're going to go after the ones that do, that have that beautiful heart, um, just like a beautiful uh, wife. Um, and they're going to try and, and come after that person and destroy them. So kill my flesh and take my heart. That's a result of loving God. And that goes back to kind of the the uh, the godly woman, you know, and 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 her prices far above rubies, and talking about what real beauty is, and it's it's being righteous and serving God and having these traits and uh, these godly traits and and things like that, and so in the world when we're walking in the world we always have to be careful because you know it's like hey when you're you know willing to work any day then your boss abides you but when you tell them I'm sorry I can't work on Shabbat they might think oh now there's a bit of division you're not like all of us willing to work and then they go oh well you know yeah we can give you that day off but then they ask you we really need someone to cover in there and they expect you because they don't have strong beliefs in God and their belief isn't worth anything to them even if they are a marginal uh, Christian or religious person they would uh, they're not going to lose their job over God you know put it that way like hey well we go to church on Sunday but you know if my boss calls me in I'm going to go in because I got to you know I got to keep you know that's that's not a very beautiful woman, you know. That's one where it's like, ah, eh, that's kind of the ugly sister, you know. Um, the fact is, the one that's really beautiful is the one that says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't go in. doesn't matter. You can fire me or not. Um, uh, this is my set-apart day where I rest. Uh, and my religion uh, doesn't allow for me to work. Well, now when you're willing to give that up, look how beautiful that heart is. And we can see this even with Avram willing to give up his own son. That is a beautiful heart that he has. It's like, it's like a beautiful wife who is so fair that it becomes so, so unique, just like great beauty of a woman that just stands out among all other people to where you can't deny it and they're like, wow, you know, that woman is amazingly beautiful. Like, that just is not ordinary. There's women like that. And, and you can imagine that in this model as being your Torah observance of, of how good-looking your heart is um, to God. And and so we see this pattern with Abraham that that his heart towards God was so beautiful that that uh, that people wanted to, he had to be afraid because of how much he loved God because people as a result would want to kill him and we can see this all the way through it happened with Mashiach and they did kill him again for the same thing because of his beautiful wife in that sense because his heart towards God was so beautiful and so unlike anyone else's heart that they wanted to um, destroy him and uh, and ultimately as we see both times with Yitzhak and Avraham is that it is God who provides the protection for Yitzhak and for Avraham and that even once their uh, wife is revealed, that when people come in then and try, and just like he told Avimelech, you know, let this guy's wife go, or you're a dead man. And, and you know, Yorewahe was coming in and, and protecting him. And this is what God always does when people are willing to follow him. He'll come in and be their protection and provide for them. 
And so this is the, you know, Abraham or Yitzhak maybe couldn't have provided that protection for themselves. But it's not going to come from them. Their only job is to, it's, it's just like a man and a woman relationship. The woman has her job to her husband. And her husband will take care of her and provide for her and, and protect her. That's his job. And it's the same way when you have that relationship with God, that if you're doing your job and obeying Him and submitting to His will and and caring for Him and ministering to Him and, and having His judgment, not your judgment, all these things, then He'll be there to protect you. He'll be there to provide you for you. He'll do all those things. Trust me, He's as good a husband as you're going to be able to find. And uh, the question isn't how good he is as a husband. It's what's wrong with you as his wife. Are you doing your job? And so next we get to the wells of water. Okay, what are they fighting over? What are these wells? Why is this important? Well, well, obviously brought forth water. It's used to water your flocks. You know, they, they would use it to sustain themselves. Um, these are sources and resources that you can count on their necessities of life and so the question is is you do the work you dig the well but you know other people are coming in and trying to take away your source of life right the thing that, that God provided for you and rewarded for your hard work you dug down in the earth Right, and you found the water. And God provided the water, w w which will sustain you. You know, workman is worthy of their hire. So here, both times, the herdsmen want to just take from Avraham or from Yitzhak from their hard work. Notice the same pattern here. So if that work, right, if that wife is that beautiful heart towards God, and and in the same way. There's a lot of religious people that want to come in and get the blessing, right? Because everyone's like, oh, this is the Palestine. You know, these are the bad guys, you know? And the religious people, they can't be the bad guys. They're the ones working towards God's things, and, and it must be the other people that are the bad guys. I don't know that. I don't know that at all. Because the reality is, is when you look at this, everybody's trying to seize, right? Just like the Pharisees double entendre there, Pharisees. Um, I love biblical humor. This is just random. Um, they're trying to seize on the promises of God, right? We're the seed of Avraham. Okay? So what? What are you trying to claim? Whether it's Jews in Judaism, whether it's Christianity, you know, hey, we've got Jesus. Jews are, hey, we're the Jews. You know, the Messianics, hey, we're the Messianics, whatever. Everybody thinks they got it right. The Mormons think they got it right. No, the Seventh-day Adventists think they got it right. You know, all of these different sects of, of different religious people all think they've got the key thing. Every congregation thinks, well, they got it right. You know, their statement of faith is the good one. You know, and that's, oh, they've got the ministry. And, oh, God wants them to, you know, to open up the... Uh, the sports court or or to do this and that and it's like it's ridiculous everybody thinks that they're the one and they think it, it, everyone's fighting over the wells of water right the word of God they're saying oh we've got the Torah you know this is given to us you know or they're saying hey we got the New Testament and that's given to us so they say oh we got this Fighting over wells of water. Okay, the water is the word. And people are trying to take it away from other people and and theological debates will essentially fighting over a well of water, right? And at the end of the day, Yorewahe is you know, they even they even filled them up with dirt, right? The wells that Avraham dug. You know, and that's the same way as people trying to reinterpret the scriptures. You know, that's like filling them with dirt. That's like 
when when a Christian says, "Well, we're not under the law," or you know, "Oh, you know, he fulfilled the law," and they misquote the scriptures, that's like trying to put dirt back into a well. That well was bringing life-giving water, it was bringing you the truth. That's what the word's supposed to do. But if you read the word and you think that the word is telling you God doesn't care what you do and it's okay to sin and to break his commandments, then you're drinking dirt. You're going to die. You're not getting the water that God put in that well. You've covered it back up. You refuse to hear the blessing that was in there. That that law, when you refuse to hear it, that law is water. It refreshes your soul. It cleanses you. It cleans you. As it says, so that you could be presented blameless before the Father. That's what the Word does. It washes you. So if you if you made the Word of no effect and, and, and misinterpreted things and tried to ignore verses or the Torah or whatever it is that you're trying to do, hey, you're just trying to remove the life from that well, the life-giving water. You know? You're just filling in that well that Avraham and the people before you and Messiah had dug. Okay? But you know what? Just like Avraham dug the well and then other people came and filled it, and another generation will come out with his son, right? Who's my father? Who's my mother? Uh, who's my mother? Who's my brother? Also, oh, we're the seed of Avraham, and you'd have Avraham's work. What did Avraham do? He dug well. They filled it back up. So what? Go redig it again. That's what the messianics, a lot of them, are doing. They're simply acting as Yitzhak, redigging the wells of Avraham. They're going back there. And, and they're taking the dirt. And yes, sometimes that dirt even includes traditions from Judaism. Sometimes that's dirt that's covered up the truth. Doesn't mean all traditions are bad, right? But again, it's all measured back. If that tradition in some way violates the Torah, then I don't care if a thousand rabbis said this is what this verse means or this is what we should do. This is how we interpret it. If it's wrong, if it's going against the Torah, then... With your tradition, you've put dirt back into the well of Avraham. And it's up to people who have that beautiful wife, who have that heart that loves God, to go and re-dig again the well. And people will try and take it away. And people will fight over the wells. People will fight over the things that Avraham dug in the first place. You're going to fight with people over what the Torah means. You're going to fight with people over what the New Testament means. Okay. You're gonna fight with people over whether you should or shouldn't be religious, you know. You can go over you know, there's enemies outside the house and there's enemies inside the house. Okay? There's enemies that don't have anything to do with the Bible and there's enemies that that, that think that they're standing up for it. Okay? But the truth that's worth fighting for. And and those who do the will of his father, those are the brethren. Those guys and and gals will be redigging the wells of Avraham. Okay? So this is what happens. You're fighting over what? We're fighting over the truth. Okay, a well is a source of water. These are even like uh, I see them many times as as uh, teachers. Can be wells as as well. <laughs> so uh, they're a source of water, right? And and so people interpret things. You know, you can interpret. Yeah, you want to interpret the New Testament one way. I can interpret it another way. Okay. You're drinking dirt, right? I'm trying to drink water. You know, because that's what well is supposed to do. Bring forth life-giving water. Okay? So, it's important to understand when we're reading about these things that the patterns are staying the same. And so then you got to figure out, well, what do these things represent? What are they? Next we get into Yaakov and the controversy. So the second 
half of this, well, probably last quarter really, of this parasha is the whole concept of Yaakov, right? He's born, and he, 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 uh, he didn't steal the birthright as a lot of people kind of, I think they're sloppy in a sense. Um, he took the blessing, but he legitimately bought the birthright because Aesop sold it. There's nothing that could be said, you know, about, you know, him doing that. That was, he sold it. It was a legitimate transaction. Now, the blessing is always weird. And every year I always thought, even, even my son asked me, he's like, well, if he stole it, you know, can he, is God still going to honor that blessing when it seems like he kind of he kind of deceived him to get it? And that is a good question. There's a lot of things that are difficult to understand in the scripture. And I always thought, well, if it was based on a lie, you know, how is that honored, you know? I mean, a person could make the argument and say, hey, you know, that's, that's ill-gotten gains, right? Uh, it's like unjust gains. You know, it won't profit you, Torah says. So, even if you lied to get it, it's, how can it profit you? And, there, you know, I think there's other ways to look at this. And something that really stood out to me this year was this, this concept back when we see the start of this week's parish actually go back to uh, Genesis 25-ish and we see that uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. we see this where he says uh, in verse 25-23 it says, and Yodi Wahe said unto her. So she's asking about why this is this way with these two kids seem to be fighting. And Yodi Wahe said unto her, two nations are in your womb and two manner of people shall be separated from your bowels. The one shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. Okay? So this is a prophecy from God telling about what's going on in there. So when we get to this, part of Yaakov dressing up and even Rivka because at first you think hey Rivka what are you doing I mean shouldn't you just be listening to Yitzhak and 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 he's going to bless he loves Asaph and and why would you want to mess with that if he tells him to go do something why would you come is his wife now deceiving him and his son is deceiving him and you're thinking how can anything good come out of that why would that blessing be allowed to stand that way? You know, wouldn't they be in the wrong? Well, I don't know that because of this verse right here in 23. Because the fact is, is Yode Wahe is the one that said that the elder shall serve the younger, right? And and that one was going to be mightier than the other. So the fact is, that's what's happening. So. It made me question if Yitzhak, right? Because we go back to patterns. Yitzhak loves Esau, it says. And so we instantly think, oh, well, Rivka uh, loves Yaakov. Well, these must just be personal preferences. I don't know that. The fact is, God already said there that the younger was going to be served by the elder. So he, he already prophesied the blessing that Yitzhak is going to give. So is that outside of the will of God for Rivka or Yaakov to go in and do that? The person would say, well, they didn't know that. Well, you don't know what they know. You didn't know what they were doing. The fact is, it's possible, you know, and people a lot of times they'll say, they'll come up with a theory and they'll start slamming it down as fact. Oh, yeah, well, guess what? Yitzhak was doing X, Y, Z. You don't know that. I'm theorizing Okay, and I'm not going to get haughty about one person or another who's written of in the scriptures because hey, they're written of and they're pretty important people. Me, I'm not. So I'm not going to get all 
hey, look at this, I can't believe Moshe did that, or I can't believe this. You know, people do that all the time. I think that's kind of crazy. Like, it's about respect. You know, just like what Yodi Wahi says, how were you not afraid to speak against my servant, Moshe, right? And people all the time, oh yeah, he did this, he did that. You know, things that they don't know exactly is intent for doing things. They're reading the scriptures and they're kind of mouthing off about people. I don't really do that. But based on the text, my theory would be that it's possible that Yitzhak was, right, if this is said about the younger, right, then it's possible that Yitzhak should have loved, I mean, he should have been promoting the younger in a way. And maybe he wasn't willing to. Maybe he was just going with Asaph. Right, and and it said because he loved his his venison, which is a again taking us back to food. That's an earthly desire, right? Um, when God's already said that the younger is going to be served by the elder, and so in my opinion, this is the will of God. This isn't something that that uh, Rivka cooked up or. Or that Yaakov just uh, went and stole and was in the wrongdoing. This is how it's supposed to be. And if I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, Yitzhak really, and he does bless him after the fact. He doesn't come back and say, hey, you lied to me. I'm going to take all that blessing back or I'm going to do, you know, that. He blesses him. And uh, before he sends him off to Badan Aram. So. Uh, after he knows what happened. So to me, I get the vibe that now he's back on track with the goal of God and with the plan of God. Because we see this exact same thing with Yishmael, don't we? Because Avraham said when he made the promise about Yitzhak, he said, oh, that Yishmael might live before you. Right? So he's still promoting Yishmael when the promise isn't given to Yishmael, it's it's being told it's going to go to Yitzhak. And then we see the same thing here, in my opinion, with his son Yitzhak, who's promoting Esau, when, when in reality the promise is, is and the blessing is going to be going to Yaakov. And ultimately that's how it ends up going, whether they love the other one a lot or, or not. And so... You know, those are some of my thoughts and things that might spark some conversation for you about the controversy over Yaakov and, and the blessing and how this all went down. Um, and one of the interesting things that it actually used to bug me is on the verse when he goes in uh, and he says, uh, let me see, let me pull it up here. I think it's in 26. Um, where he says, actually, no, it's not in 26. It's further down. Where he says, okay, you know, how have you found it so fast? And I always thought that he says, oh, well, uh, Yori Wahe has provided, let me get to the actual verse here. Ba, 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 ba. Father of. Yeah, he said, uh, in verse 20, Gen Genesis 27, 20, he says, And Yitzhak said unto his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because Yodiwahe, your Elohim, brought it to me. Now that always actually used to bother me, because I could, even though I thought, like, okay, this is what was supposed to happen, it seems like there was um, deception, and even Yaakov was like, Won't I see him as a deceiver? Uh, you know, and then you get to this point where I felt like before in, in, that when he asked him, how have you found it? Okay, there's a difference from doing what your mother tells you to do and she says, you know, it curses be upon me and all this. But when you get to the point where you start to lie in God's name, that's the part where I've always been uncomfortable with that verse when I was thinking even if you try and kind of make things work around, isn't he kind of lying, straight up lying in God's name that 
Yodewahe, your Elohim brought it to me? I mean, what about the repercussions of saying that when in reality he didn't go and hunt it at all? So that always stuck out to me. But then this year, I think I found a, uh, the context where it makes sense. Because when we take it back to the promise uh, and the prophecy of God, then in reality, it is actually true. It's kind of funny because this whole little thing, right, where you're trying to figure out, wait a minute, first it's about kind of deception, and it's like, how is this okay? Um, and then what I came to was that it was okay, but it was just a different way of looking at it, and people go, oh, no, you know, it just was wrong, and all of this, but this reminds me of She Is My Sister. That's the resonating thing. It's like, wait a minute. She's not, I mean, technically she's your sister, but really she's your wife. And so notice that we're dealing with that in this week's parashah. And then we get to that same thing, the controversy over Yaakov, where something is being portrayed as something that it isn't. But in reality, she was his sister, right? Like with Avraham and stuff. And, and what we're seeing is that there's this pattern of almost teaching us that what that something can appear more than one way and it can still be accurate and so if that's our mindset in looking at Yaakov then we say wait a minute okay so so technically Yoriwahe did prophesy that this is so they're not outside the will of God they're actually in the will of God by making this happen um, then we go to this next part where it says how did you get it so fast Right? And he says, Because Yodewahe, your Elohim, has brought it to me. Technically, that's true, in my opinion. He found it so fast because it is Yaakov and he was the chosen one. The whole thing with his mom having him dress up and preparing the kid of the goats, all that may be in the context of the fact that he's actually this is supposed to happen and this is the chosen one so if God said it was going to happen then when all this stuff does happen and he gets the meat faster than his brother who's out hunting for it then that is in my opinion in the will of God and therefore he can legitimately say because Yodi Wahe your Elohim brought it to me that's why he's gotten it so fast he got the promise and because of that he's supplanting his brother and so I thought that was a very interesting um, point that I'm, I'm glad I kind of resolved for myself in my own mind um, because that part always kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, next we get into that, you know, as we already talked about Ishmael and Esau is that same pattern with Yitzhak and Avraham favoring their eldest when ultimately the, the promise was going to go to the younger. Um, and, and this brings us all back full circle to this concept of Yodi Wahe providing. What does Yodi Wahe provide? Yodi Wahe provides the truth. Okay? That's what he provided when he gave the prophecy. He tells us the truth. Right? And it's our job to live up to that truth. I think that's what Rivka and Yaakov did ultimately. And I don't think it was just of their, you know, something separate or of their own intentions or anything like that. I think that they were, um, even in their actions, fulfilling the word of God whether they were doing it on on purpose or, or, or whether he was stating this is what was going to happen the fact is is that it's blessed and that's our proof right the underlying thing is that it's blessed and it's accepted Yitzhak accepts it ultimately God accepts it and blesses Yaakov all these things are accepted and that's the proof right even like Moshe saying how do I know you know, that I have found favor, is it not that you go with us and that you are among us? Right? There's proof. And if you see the proof, then you know that you found favor. And if God isn't willing to be among you and not willing to lead you and, and travel with you, then you know that that's proof of the other, that you're not having his favor. Right? I mean, it's clear cut. And, and it's the same way. When you're doing the will of God, when you're obeying, He's going to bless you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to provide children. He's going to provide protection. He's going to provide water. He's going to provide the blessings. Because he says, 
if you keep my commandments right, that is blessing. He said before you blessing and cursing, life and death, right? If you choose to obey God, then you'll you'll receive those blessings. That's just what it says. So all these things are things that he first provides the truth and then your response to the truth determines what you get. That's the told of the generations. What do you beget? What is coming out of you? Is it is it good things? Are you spiritual or is it earthly things? Because God is spiritual and you can measure your spiritual fruit. And, and the earthly fruit can be deceptive as Mashiach points out. The outside can look clean. But the inside, right, that's what matters. And so Yodi Wahi provides us the truth. And and just like Yitzhak, when he prayed, it was accepted. God heard him and provided him children. When when he went among these other nations who might have wanted to harm him, God provided him protection and his father protection, the same protection from Avimelech and the people. Ultimately, he tells his people not to harm him, but it's not him that's providing the protection. It's God. Because God said he would kill him and put the fear of God in Avimelech so that Avimelech knew not to mess with Abraham or his children. And and then we get the water. The Er Shiva. Well of seven. Right? The water. The words of the Sabbath. That is the one that we get to keep. That's the one, right, that that is our blessing. And and we can draw water from that. And we can feed our flocks and and sustain ourselves and wash ourselves with Be'er Shiva, the, the well that both of them ultimately were able to maintain control over. And uh, that ultimately leads us to the blessing that Yodai Wahe provides when we respond accordingly and we do our job. So until next time, I want to say Shalom. Uh, subscribe to our video. Uh, like our page. Check out loveandtorah.com, our website. You can get the weekly Torah portion and their daily readings on there and a whole bunch of other resources. I'm still working on putting stuff up there, so I'll continue to add more resources for you. And uh, I hope this was a blessing to you. Shalom.